Hello and welcome to Alive and Composing and occasionally performing with today's guest, Kyle Saulnier. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Kyle Saulnier. Saulnier. Oh, you said that with kind of a Cajun twang. I was yeah. Thinking it might be uh, Bordeaux region, but no. No, uh, my, my family, uh, my father's family is from Nova Scotia, so the Acadian stuff up there. Okay, so you you were playing the button squeeze box accordion from the uh, zero? Or? Uh, no, I wish I wish I'd be I'd be a lot better at the button squeeze box accordion, you know, if, if that were the case. But, uh, what are you good at? Well, uh, musically or no, I, I don't no, not musically. Let, let's start away from music. Um, I, that's a good question. I'm I'm good at equivocating. Uh, I'm good at uh, talking. I'm good at hearing myself talk. I, really, this is an uncomfortable place to be. I'm good at very few things besides music, I think. That's right. We, we've, got a, we've got a big memory chip here, so if you just want Great. to talk for as long Great. as yeah, you I need. can. I can do that. I can talk about nothing for a long time. You can fill up those YouTubes. Yeah. Um, okay, do you have any pets at home? This is what the real question. I do. I do. Actually, I have two cats. Uh, my wife and I have, have two cats. The oldest one is somewhat of a celebrity among uh, our close friends, or at least it's our friends. It's not Grumpy Cat, is it? I'm sorry? It's not Grumpy Cat, is it? It... Well, he's very, he is very, it's not grumpy cat proper noun, but okay. he's a very grumpy cat. He, he was about 25 pounds at his largest. He's down to around 15, 16. He fluctuates now, but uh, as a result of that weight loss, uh, or the, the weight loss is a result of him being on a crash diet for about four years. So he's miserable. He's always starving. Um, uh, he's bad tempered. Uh, ornery he hates most people um, I don't know if your camera can pick up I've got a little scratch here from where he bit me on the face yesterday because I uh, didn't feed him quick enough the celebrities will do that all the time he is uh, he's I, I love him but he's ornery and then we have a, a younger one who's uh, very small very cute pretty much the exact opposite nice little uh, lap cat if you will and do these have creative names that somehow give us a glimpse into your artistic process? No, uh, the oldest one is named Jax, uh, uh, Ajax, as in Ajax the Great. There were there were two Ajaxes in, in uh, Greek history, and I, I seem to have forgotten uh, both of them at the moment. Uh, and the youngest one is named Zoe, and we just sort of, we like the names, you know. And also, I think... Um, and they go from A to Z, of course. They, they go from A to Z, and in Scrabble, they do a lot with a little, both of them. Uh, describe your first sound memory. That's a great idea. Uh, the only thing that's coming to mind, and I have a, I have a very uh, selective memory as far as my childhood and pretty much anything that's happened in the past 24 hours. Um, I remember the sound of falling down the stairs when I was a, a really small child, and I don't know, I, I have to say, you know, just in case my parents See this? I don't know if I actually fell down the stairs. I, I it might be a false memory, but I, I do remember very vividly the visual and the sound of of that. Like I'm talking about, like like really tiny child, like rolling down a flight of stairs, which may explain a lot. Well, that explains everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, whether or not they pushed you is, is probably the statute. Of limitations uh, you know, I think it. Yeah. Yeah. Statute of limitations. Uh, do you think there's any kind of uh, clattery, dramatic, and or flying motifs in your creative life ever since? I don't think there's any flying motifs. I, I do tend to favor um, the bombastic, uh, maybe maybe to a fault. I, I I like a lot of sound. I like to be overwhelmed by sound, you know. And that's the music that I uh, tend to make. That's the music that I think tends to grab me the most. Maybe not volume, but just any sound that is overwhelming. I, I like to not be able to handle. So something kind of visceral and immersive. Yeah, maybe exactly. Cool. Uh, early musical instrument influences or moments in your life when you witnessed a work of art. It could be a poem, a painting, uh, something that really spoke to you and said, "I can do that." Early on, I would say no. Um, you know, the, there there are a couple of instances in my collegiate and onward life. Um, the track that really kind of changed everything for me uh, is, is called Planet of Tears. It's by Tom Pearson, who's this, uh, at the moment, reclusive uh, chap living in, in uh, Japan in as much obscurity as he can. But uh, that, I was 18, I was 19, I think, and, and it just, it changed everything for me. And describe that track. It sounds kind of obscure and interesting. It is, it's overwhelming. Pearson does a lot with form. Uh, he does a lot with um, 
very sharp contrast in orchestration and in, in uh, dynamic level. Um, he really, the band he was writing for was, was uh, like a jazz orchestra, like a, a big band type of instrumentation. And he clearly is writing for it as an orchestra. And, and that, that sound, just the texture of that, of that track to me, um, I mean, it was, it was a revelation. Uh, so you went to college, did you study music? I studied music. I, I started off um, at a small liberal arts school in South Carolina uh, studying classical composition and, and theory uh, for two years and I was, um, it just wasn't a good fit. It was a great school, great people, great faculty, uh, just wrong fit. So I transferred after two years up to Berklee College of Music um, and I did a dual degree there in jazz composition and music business and management. And then I did my master's degree at Manhattan School of Music. Uh, I hear a lot of music from Berkeley graduates who are really kind of great at everything. <laughs> uh, is that daunting? Is that atmosphere something that you like to be part of? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, and it certainly speaks to the school. The, every college is, is what you make of it. I mean, that's, you know, if you, you, you can go to any school anywhere, and if you decide that you're going to suck everything out of that college that you can, you can get as much out of it as you want. And Berkeley, to me, was like the epitome of that. There's people that waste a decade there and do nothing. There's people that go in with all the talent in the world and leave with all the talent in the world, and that's it. You know, and then there's people that go there with nothing and come out animals, absolute animals. So, it, you know, um, those people that you're hearing that are, you know, the cream of the crop coming out of, of Berkeley, I mean, that's, those are the people that really worked, you know? I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of people that you never hear about that go to that school too, but, but fortunately the track record of the, the people that are willing to work the hardest is very good. Do you find yourself recreating some of those experiences with, with your own band? Uh... Not really, because when I was there, I, I, I had the sound in my head, but I hadn't figured it out yet. I, 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 I had not realized, I had not figured out how to, how to put the sound from the head onto the paper. I, I, I couldn't make that translation yet. And so everything about um, my own music sort of came later. I, like I was working out a lot of important stuff while I was there, but it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't fully realized at all. And what is the role of paper or, or equivalent in your in your way of working? Is, is a lot of it done orally? Is it charts to refer to later? Is it oh. something to improv from, or is it pretty precisely planned? Um, it depends on the piece. And you said you said the role of paper. Like, uh, what, do you, what do you mean? In, in uh, I, you said you, getting your ideas down on paper. Oh yeah, what, yeah, uh, yeah. To, in, in a way that kind of fulfilled your vision. But I wonder how much of that was physically on paper, or if it is. Just, it is all physically on paper. I don't write at the computer, um, and. I, I get into a lot of trouble when I just sort of like play improvise uh, on any instrument. I, I, I found the, the best way for me is away from the piano, away from any instrument, um, just pencil and paper. There's something still very, very physical and very uh, visceral about it that, that I think, at least I require. Other, you know, everybody's got their own process. I can't, I can't not put pencil to paper and come out with something that I, or at least I haven't yet, and come out with something that I'm happy with. Okay, so you've composed pieces, but do you also compose the band, the, the Awakening Orchestra? How did that dawn? Um, well, I've wanted a band since I since I started sort of messing around with composition. You know, I was about fifteen, sixteen, and writing really worthless stuff that I I've, I've saved, and it will never see the light of day. I promise you. Um, but. Uh, I, do, I don't write for specific people in terms of composing the band. You can't do that in today's world. I mean, and I say that, and of, of course I still do. It's a lie, I do. But you, you can't. I mean, you, you can't afford to do that. I do compose for specific approaches. You know, like in a certain chair in my band is, is a person who I, I know to have a certain general, very general approach to where if, if I set up a set of stimuli for them, if I set up yeah, if I set up that set of stimuli, I can, in a very general way, predict how they're going to react to that stimuli. You know, whether as a soloist or as just an aleatoric element behind something, or even in, as a written line um, with very little instruction, I know how they're going to come at that line. And so if, if my first call person can't do a gig or can't do a session or anything, um, the person that I call to replace them 
has to be somebody that has a same or a similar. It's never going to be the same. A, a similar general approach to where they're going to react in a in a in that same predictable way to that stimuli. And how do you manage a band like the Awakening Orchestra in today's environment? You cry do, a lot. Do, do you have an angel in the wings? Do you have lots of Kickstarter yeah. friends? Well, Kickstarter uh, was a huge element in funding the record, um, and that is uh, a platform for which I am extremely grateful. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I could not have done it without that. It's just there's just there's just too many people there, um, and so I'm I'm very grateful for that. In terms of you know the day to day operations of the band. Um, nobody has it. I don't. I don't know anybody that has it figured out. You, you just have a telephone and a Rolodex. And I have a telephone. I have a Rolodex. I have um, post-it notes. And I have. I think it. It sort of requires um, musicians to be willing to jump through some hoops for you. And I think, as the composer of that music and as the leader of that uh, ensemble it puts a lot of uh, responsibility on me to make sure that when they show up, the music's going to be worth it to them. The hang is going to be worth it. You know, they need to like each other and there needs to be no weak links in the ensemble. And that uh, the, there's also the responsibility on me to, to really be on my game as far as organization, as far as dotting the I's, crossing the T's. Every, every musician has played a lot of gigs where there's just for lack of a better word, just bullshit from start to finish where just amateurish stuff from whoever's leading the session or whoever wrote the chart or anything. It's my job if I'm asking these people to jump through hoops for me to make sure that they show up and their experience is a positive musical experience in every possible way. Are you booking the, the gigs as well? Do you find yourself performing at clubs and festivals? or what, what are the uh, kind of At this point, I'm, you know, I'm just doing the hustle myself. Okay, sorry. Um, I do the do the hustle. We didn't need to go there. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, no, I'm just I'm just hustling it myself, sort of you know performing here and there around the city whenever I can. And it's it's uh, it's pretty seldom. You know, there's you can't afford to work every week with with a band like this. You know, I, I lose my shirt every time we play. Um, so it really is. It's a sporadic um, production. And, where do you get your next shirt from? Do you have a day job? Do you teach? Uh, I do teach. I teach uh, as an adjunct faculty member in music at Quinnipiac University, which is in Hamden, Connecticut, just north of New Haven. Love it there. Um, and I'm from central Connecticut, so those are kind of my old digs. Um, and uh, aside from that, a lot of uh, composition work, a lot of, uh, a lot of copy work uh, for other composers, um, gigs here and there, playing, whatever it takes. What are the pros and cons of New York City versus uh, you know, Nova Scotia or wherever? It yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm very, I'm very conflicted about New York City. I think professionally, I, I love it, and professionally, um, I'm very grateful for this city to be here and to to be in such an environment. There's only one place like this as far as musical talent, musical openness, um, the ability to get the band that I can get. Uh, that's why that's why people come here. Um, Personally, I'm not as much of a city person. I am a, I am a person who loves solitude, who loves, um, I wouldn't say the small town vibe. Um, I'm working very hard at being as grateful for this city personally as I am professionally. So it's, it's a process. Uh, what's the awakening about? Was that a, a moment of Satori that came to you one morning? Or you know. The, why, why the name? I don't know that I have a great answer for you. I, I like the idea that the orchestra itself is awakening. You know, maybe maybe in terms of um, I, I don't. It, it's it's not so much in terms of like the, the the more spiritual concept of the awakening. Whatever people take from that in in that sense, uh, I have no problem with because it's it's a it's a, a beautiful concept. For me, it was more about the music itself waking up, you know, in, in, in and of itself, not necessarily waking up, you know, a collective consciousness or anything. Uh, this is not the answer. What, what was the question? Mm -hmm. Primarily, it's a, it's a politically driven piece. And I, I, I want to be very careful because, you know, the second you get start getting specific about that, things can get hairy. Um, it's, it's fairly specific to me 
but I don't want it to be necessarily very specific to anyone else. I'll, I'll say that um, I'm very disillusioned, very, very disillusioned um, at the moment. And I, I, I struggle, I think, a lot with trying to not just be another disillusioned, angry young man, you know. Um, but I feel very conflicted about, you know, about my, my country, my own allegiances, my, um, the, the current state of, of, of affairs, uh, here and, and worldwide. And there's a, there's a, there's a couple of other layers to that piece in terms of the state of, uh, jazz as a music today and in terms of, you know, just myself in, in terms of uh, where, where my own head is at. Um, and it's a very negative title. My mother hates that title. She hates it. She's like, why does it have to be so negative? And I don't I, It's just, I, I just sort of find, especially as, as in the process of composing that piece, looking, myself looking around um, and saying this, this isn't it. This isn't what it's supposed to be, you know? And that said, uh, you know, am I proposing any solutions? No, I'm not, so. Hey, you're making music. I'm making music, and, and I am I'm making, I'm making, yeah, I'll leave it there. And lastly, why do you wear two watches? I have two wrists. Thank you very much. <laughs>